So we are, we started the, the chapter, chapter two on the middle class transform last time. And um, remember, where our main focus here with it is learning about a tool that can help you solve certain kinds of differential equations. Okay. The differential equations that are up for solution here are ones of the of this form here, shown in equation 2.1. These are uh, the sort of number of adjectives attached here. They're ordinary differential equations, meaning it's just the unknown function here, y is just a function of a single variable, t. So there's no partial derivatives, just normal <laughs> ordinary derivatives. Um, it's linear. Linear means that um, you never have two different derivatives of different orders multiplied together, and you never have a single derivative raised to a certain power. Linear means that um, this uh, the effect at the left-hand side can be thought of as the application of a linear operator onto the unknown function y. The linear operator is made up out, out of various uh, differentiation operators. Right? But you never have any nonlinear behavior of different derivatives multiplied together or any single derivative raised to a power apart from one. <clears throat> and the constant coefficients bit, well, if you do, if it was just totally constant coefficients, that would mean probably that all of the AIs and this thing on the right hand side were constants. But it's, it's a little bit more general. So the AI, which are the coefficients of the Y. A, a naught is the coefficient of the unknown function y. The other ai's are the coefficients of the various derivatives of y. Those are all just fixed constants, so constant quantities. This other term over on the other side, I mean, if this was zero, you'd call it a homogeneous differential equation from the bit. The bit which doesn't have anything to do with y is zero. That's called a homogeneous equation. But here. We can see functions of the of the of the variable t appear in there. And as long as this function of t here is relatively nice and well behaved, meaning as long as we can take the Laplace transform of it, then we should be able to apply the transport the Laplace transform method to find the solution of this differential equation. And the, the main idea is, and the thing I illustrated with the metaphor with the logarithms last time. Logarithms is a tool which allows you to simplify numerical computations because it turns powers into products and it turns products into sums. So it's a lot easier to do arithmetic with the logarithms of inputs, evaluate an answer there, and then take the inverse transform, which is taking the exponential of the result. Okay. The Laplace transform method works somewhat similarly to that in that you don't attempt to solve the differential equation directly. You instead transform it into a different kind of object, well, still into an equation, but this time not a differential equation, but more a kind of algebraic equation, which can be solved by just pretty much straightforward algebraic manipulation. The transform is the, is the Laplace transform, and then you solve the transformed equation you have a solution to the transformed equation, and then you apply the inverse Laplace transform, which brings you back to the solution to your original equation. That's the way it's going to work. So what exactly is the Laplace transform? So we met this last time. The Laplace transform of a function f of t is this integral here. So you're integrating from 0 to infinity the exponential e to the minus st multiplied by f of t dt. Now, what this object is, okay, it's an integral, but more generally, this is a function of this new variable x, okay? It's not a function of the variable t, because we're, we're kind of summing up all the values of t, all the values of f of t here, and bundling them all up together, okay? So what, what this expression does depend on is it depends on, the, depends on the value of x. So this is actually a function of x. There's various, pieces, various ways of notating it. Often we use the capital version of the lowercase letter name of the function, so little f as a Laplace transform capital F, 
it's a function of s. Sometimes we use an overline over the original function name. Or sometimes we indicate the application of curly L, handwriting L, script L, application of curly L to, to your function. And L represents the Laplace transform operator. Okay. So this notation is nice, this capital F one, because it's, it's a capital version of the lowercase letter. It's still something to do with F. But this notation is also nice because it visualizes it as an operation that's applied to the original function. We'll mix, mix and match the notations to a certain extent, okay, sometimes using one over the other. Okay. So what did we do last time with this? Um, we looked at a few basic examples, meaning a few relatively straightforward functions, and we looked at what their Laplace transforms were. We took the constant function 1, found that it had a Laplace transform 1 over s. Now, there were convergence criteria attached to this. Because it's an infinite integral, you have a question of maybe does it converge or not. And this was found to converge for every value of s. s is actually can be a complex variable. As long as the real part of s was greater than 0, then this integral converged. I haven't got that written there on the notes, but we wrote that out when we did it, did it uh, in the example. So there are convergence criteria. These, these expressions might only be valid for certain, for values of s in a certain region of the plane. But as long as they exist for some values of s, we can make use of them and uh, use them in our method. So that was the constant function. We then looked at the function t, f of t equals t. We found that it had a Laplace transform 1 over s squared. We then looked at an exponential, e to the minus a t. We did all of these last time, I believe. And that came out, the Laplace transform of that was 1 over s plus a. Now we could keep playing that game, so to speak, taking all the kind of standard useful functions that we encounter and working out their, their Laplace transforms. And indeed, there are some of those features exercises in the tutorial exercises. But what we'll, allow, what we'll make use of is um, the table of Laplace transforms. So the next two pages in the notes are extracted from the formula handbook, which is available during exams and so on. Um, and this lists a load of standard functions down the left. And on the right-hand column, there, <clears throat> the Laplace transform of those functions. So we'll make use of this as a useful reference. Value. So we can start on the left and apply the Laplace transform to read it off here on the right, and we can also use it in the opposite direction. When we come to solving the differential equations, at the end of the process, we'll have to take our solution to the transformed equation and transform it back to be an original function of t, so there, we'll be looking to locate the function somewhere on the right, and then reading off its inverse transform by moving to the corresponding function on the left. Okay? That's how we're going to be making use of the table. Also featured at the end of the table are these items here, which are general properties of the transform. I won't talk through them all now because we're going to prove these properties, so we'll describe them and discuss them as we, as we, as we encounter them. Any questions so far? I mean, there's a lot which we haven't found out yet, so you know, that's, that's what we're going to be doing in the next few lectures. But anything you'd like me to clarify at the moment? Okay, is that all right? Okay, so going to page 44 in the notes, then we start to see properties of the Laplace transform. So before we before we're able to investigate it and show how it works for solving differential equations, we need to build up a bit of a, a few different tools, a bit of knowledge about how the transform works. Okay. So this is properties of the transform. Okay, so some of these proofs are in the notes, but I like to write them out and just step as we go. I think it helps. Um, okay, the first one is is quite a basic property, and it's a very very nice, and it's kind of what what is one of the parts that makes the whole thing work. 
And, and so this is here in 2.1. So this is very nice to know. Uh, the Laplace transform is a linear operator. Now that's extremely nice to know. In mathematics, if we're ever performing transformations or applying operations to things, if the things that we're applying them to are have algebraic operations similar to addition and multiplication and so on, scalar multiplication, then you certainly want to investigate whether that this operation you're doing is linear or not. Okay? Because the operations or transforms that are linear are much more easy to understand than operations which are nonlinear. Linear is everything moving in straight lines, kind of, and all relationships are through straight lines and planes and so on. Um, and there's no kind of funny curvy relationships around. So linearity is very good to know about when it, when it, when it exists. So what is this going to mean in particular? This is going to mean if you take the Laplace transform of a linear combination of two functions, so you start off with two component functions, little f and little g, you form a linear combination of them. So the alpha and beta call them real numbers, it would work as well if they're complex numbers, but the alpha and beta are just two fixed scalar coefficients. So what you got inside the curly brackets there is a new function of t. Function of t, which is a linear combination of our previous functions, little f and little g. And saying that the transform is linear just means that the value of this transform will be the same as alpha times the transform of f plus beta times the transform of g. A little proviso providing the transforms of f and g exist. Okay. But as long as f and g have Laplace transforms, then the Laplace transform of this new function you get, building it out of f and g by forming a linear combination, is just the linear combination of the individual transform. So it's a very natural property. You should recognize it and appreciate and recognize the structure of linearity there. It's exactly the same property in a slightly different context, like for instance, you're looking at linear transformations in the linear algebra part of this unit. But it's the same property, T of alpha U plus beta V is alpha T of U plus beta T of V. It's exactly the same thing. So um, we'd like to prove this. We'd like to convince ourselves that this is true. Now, it's not a kind of proof that's going to work from the very bottom of the picture. We're not going to be dealing with fundamental, you know, getting involved in technical analytical details. What we're just going to do here is use the fact that the Laplace transform is an, is an operator based on integration and then just make use of the fact that we already know integration is a linear operator. Okay? That should be something that's familiar to you. If you take the integral of a linear combination of functions, it's just equal to the linear combination of the individual integrals of the functions, provided that those integrals exist. Okay, so we're going to use the fact that integration is a But this is also quite common in mathematics that properties of simpler objects, here meaning integrals, properties of simpler objects extend to corresponding properties of more complicated objects that you build out of those. So here we're building a plus transform where we're using integration, properties of integration pass through to be properties of small and small. So what is, by definition, what's the Laplace transform of this? It's the integral from 0 to infinity, e to the minus st, multiplied by alpha f of t plus b g of t. Doing this integration with respect to t. 
we don't know what the functions f and t are. We're not going to be able to integrate them individually or directly. But what we can do is make use of properties of just these algebraic operations amongst functions and the operation of integration. So first of all, you just um, leave the integration alone and just kind of do a bit of multiplication and expanding of the bracket here. Move the coefficients out of the way. <clears throat> you recognize here the integral of this bit, well, that's the transform of f. The integral of this bit, that's the transform of g. And are you allowed to split up this? You know, are you allowed to split up the integral into the linear combination of the smaller ones? Well, yes, because the integration is linear. So the coefficient can move to the outside, and we can consider the integral of the first term on its own, and then beta can come to the outside. And we can consider the integral of the g, the term involving g on its own. So that is using the linear, so that is by the linearity the linearity of integration. That's the key step. Key step there. Then you're just recognizing that that integral is exactly by definition. The Laplace transform of f. And this one over here is exactly the Laplace transform of g. Okay? Very short, sweet, direct proof. Okay? So we know it's linear, okay? So that's that's nice. We want to take a linear and uh, take the Laplace transform of the big complicated thing built out of addition and scalar multiplication, well, you can split it up and just look at the individual linear transforms and then combine them using the same linear operations. <clears throat> so as an example of the application of this, I mean, we'll be using it all the time when we're solving differential equations, but just as a quick example, <coughs> There in the notes, take the Laplace transform of a function 3t plus 4e to the minus 2t. Okay, I don't now have to go doing integrals now because of because I recognize well in the last lecture I already dealt with the Laplace transform of t. I already dealt with the Laplace transform of e to the something times t. This is just a linear combination of those. Three, three times this plus four times that. I've already dealt with the transforms of both of those. So I can use the linearity property now to say that this is three times the Laplace transform of t plus four times the Laplace transform of e to the minus 2t. So that's three times 1 over s plus four times 1 over s. That's either plus or minus or yes, minus a. It's going to be s plus 2. So that's using linearity and last week's lecture. Or I can say using the table of Laplace transforms. <coughs> both of these functions, the function t and the function e to the minus 2t, they can both be found on the table of Laplace transforms. So that's where I'm reading those. What's next to the story? One over uh, on the left. On the left. One over. Yeah. S. S. Yeah. S. That's a, the new variable in the um, last time. Yeah, the scope is. I'm trying to avoid fives appearing in the linear coefficients because fives and s's can sometimes be confused. But you know you should be alive to that potential for context. Is that okay? Any any queries about linearity? Right. We should all be feeling happier now that we know that the plus transform is linear. It means things will be a lot simpler than they potentially might have been. Okay. Because nonlinear things are 
harder to understand, harder to deal with. Because you can't do things like this. The process isn't linear, you can't break up the fast transform of that into this combination of smaller and the fast transform. Okay, um, the next property is theorem 2.2. which deals with, on the one hand, differentiating the Laplace transform, or, as we'll find out, this is equivalent to multiplying the original function by t. <coughs> so this is a property where you start to see some of the new or kind of interesting structure of the Laplace transform, that operations you do on the original <coughs> function turn into kind of different operations on the level of the transform. <coughs> so here we're supposing that the Laplace transform of a function little f of t is capital F of s. And then this says that if you take the Laplace transform of t times f of t, that that's the same as taking the negative derivative of the transform with respect to the variable that the transform has, S. <clears throat> so multiplying by T on the original function side of things is the same as taking the negative derivative of the function capital F on the Laplace transform side. Okay, we'll prove this from right to left. We'll start with the thing on the, on the, on the right. So minus dds of capital F, well that's minus dds of the integral from zero to infinity, e to the minus st, f of t dt. And, okay, we're not gonna get bogged down in technical detail here, but back to one variable and an integral with respect to another one, because the integrand is nice, nothing too bad going on, we can interchange those two operations. And when it comes inside, we're looking at a function of two variables, s and t, so we'll change it to a partial derivative of the thing inside the integral. Okay, so that's changing the order of the operations. Sorry, it's not a minus there, though, sorry. I left the minus behind that side. <clears throat> so we want to take the partial derivative with respect to s here. There's nothing with s going on in f, so differentiating with respect to s, this f of t is just like a constant. But there is an S up here, so you have to differentiate the exponential with respect to S. Okay. Differentiating the exponential with respect to S, you get the same exponential, e to the minus ST, and then you get a minus S coming down. Chain rule, and then you still have F of T. But you get a minus T. So it's minus t times e to the minus st f of t to t. Yep. And then, well, you got two minus signs. Remember, the integration is linear, so that minus sign can pop outside and cancel with that one. And then I'll just reorganize things in here slightly. I'll just move the factor of t. And then we, then we realize what we're looking at there is an integral, zero to infinity of this exponential factor e to the minus st multiplied by some function in the brackets there, dt. So that's exactly the Laplace transform of this function. Okay. So that's exactly the Laplace transform of t times f of t by that. Okay. So 
this is a nice pro property to know about. For example, we knew that the Laplace transform of T was 1 over S. Okay, we did that last week. So the Laplace transform of T squared, well, you see T squared is simply T times T, isn't it? So this should be minus dds of the Laplace transform of T, which is minus dd, dds of 1 over s. Minus dds of 1 over s is 1 over s squared. So we can, knowing the Laplace transform of T, we can straight away with a little bit of differentiation know the Laplace transform of T squared. We don't have to go back to the original integral definition of the Laplace transform. Okay, we can use this property of it. So. We can keep going. Now we can work out the Laplace transform of T cubed. It's going to be my, I'll just won't write it out in so many lines, but it's going to be minus dBs of the Laplace transform of T squared. Yeah? We've just worked out the Laplace transform of T squared. It's 1 over S squared. So that's going to be 1 add 2, excuse me, 2 over S cubed. Okay, the minus dBs, that gets rid of the minus sign that normally comes when you differentiate the negative power of the variable. And we pick up a factor of 2 there because when you differentiate the s to the minus 2, the minus 2 comes down and becomes s to the minus 3. And, so and you can keep going and going, but pretty soon you spot a pattern. Or more formally, we can say using induction, using mathematical induction, we get that for all values of n bigger than or equal to zero, the Laplace transform of t to the n is um, yeah, n minus one factorial Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Rewind. <laughs> sorry, sorry. The Laplace transform of the constant function is 1 over s. Now, this, this mistake isn't too hard to work out to correct. So that's 2 over s cubed. I beg your pardon. It's 2 over s cubed, so that's going to become 2 by 3 is 6 over s4. Sorry about that. Sorry, I knew something was going wrong. Yeah. It, it's n factorial over s to the power n plus 1. I knew the formula, so it wasn't matching with what I got. Okay, sorry for that stuff. You should have stopped me when I wrote that. Then. I just wrote it in the next few pages. Here. It's okay. okay. But it shows you the usefulness of that property. We now know what it is. We now know what the transform of any power of t. And of course, combine that with linearity. That means now we can find the Laplace transform of any polynomial in T. Okay, so polynomial in T is just a linear combination of terms like that. Linear combination of T to the n terms. Different powers of T, you build up your polynomial. So using linearity, using this general result, we now can take the Laplace transform of any polynomial in T. Okay? That's, uh, that's spelled out in the example uh, 2.5. Any questions, uh, queries on that? Any legibility issues? 
Okay. So yeah, so combined linearity with this. to get the Laplace transform of any polynomial. <laughs> okay, the next part that we come to is, is very interesting because it's the one that talks about taking the Laplace transform of a derivative term. Remember, your differential equation features one or more, well, if it's only got one derivative, you can just solve it by straight integration, but the genuine differential equation will feature two or more derivatives of different orders on the left-hand side of, your, of the unknown function. So in, in order to take the Laplace transform of the whole thing, we need to know how to deal with the Laplace transforms of the derivatives of the function. So that's this next property there in 2.3. The transform of derivatives property. So it tells you it tells you how to how to act when you encounter a term like this. The Laplace transform of the derivative of a function x. Now it's not going to give us a precise answer and tell us exactly what the transform is because it's a general problem. We're talking about a general function x. Or this could be a f, the f of t, whatever the name of the function is. Um, so we can't hope to know the precise value of this because we don't know precisely what the function x is. But this general property of the Laplace transform tells us how to relate this transform to the transform of x. And it relates in a, in a very nice way. So it's going to be equal to s times the Laplace transform of x of t minus <laughs> x evaluated at zero, minus the initial value of x. Remember, we're studying functions here on the domain 0 to infinity. That's where the integral goes in the Laplace transform. So, so that constant there, that minus x of 0, that's the initial value of the, of the function x. <clears throat> so it gives us this nice connection. To the, x has a certain Laplace transform. It's not the case that the Laplace transform of the derivative of x is something completely different, unrelated, but there's a very clear, simple relation, or simply stated connection between the Laplace transform of the derivative of x and the Laplace transform of x. Laplace transform of the derivative is s times whatever this is, minus that constant term. And this is also very key to, to using this to solve our differential equations. Because derivatives are very hard to deal with when you've got derivatives of different order combined together, summed together, okay? Because the different order transformations on x means you can never unravel the derivative. I mean, you can integrate to try and unravel the differentiation operator. But if you've got derivatives of different order, they'll always be separated by that order. And if you integrate them a few times, you'll end up with integrals of different orders. Or so, so you can never kind of bring the two together in a way. But the Laplace transform removes this operation of differentiation and replaces it with maybe the simpler operation of just s times, this new variable s multiplied by whatever this, so this is going to be a function of s here too. So in a way, this is where you think back to the logarithm example, where the logarithm of a, power turned into a product involving logarithms, or the logarithm of a product turned into a sum of logarithms. So the transform of a difficult operation turns into an easier operation using the individual transforms. That's the way to think about this. 
differentiation being a kind of complicated operation, but multiplication of s times another function of s being conceptually and practically um, an easier operation to deal with. Okay, so let's go for the proof of this. Um, okay, we'll have to go back to, this isn't built out of any of the previous properties necessarily. We have to go back to the original integral definition of the transform. Uh, we do it directly, so we go with the, go with the left-hand side. So by definition, this is the integral e to the minus st times the derivative dx dt dt. It's true by definition. Now, I can hardly hear myself think. Why? Because this is screaming out at me. What's it screaming out? Help, well, not help me, no. Something close to that. In this context, what's help? Did you say it there? Not take it out, no. So a method of integration. How, how can we deal with this? How can we make progress with this interval? It looks kind of difficult because you're trying to integrate a, a product of functions. T, both functions depend on t, the exponential and the derivative. But it's a product where one of them is already quoted as a derivative. And that allows you to make use of integration by parts. Remember, integration by parts operates on things that you can express as the integral of a u dv, so to speak. It was an integral of this function times a derivative of that function. Well, we can use integration by parts then. So integrating that by parts will turn into the product of the two bits, evaluated at the limit, zero, and taking the limit as zero goes to infinity. And then you subtract the integral of the undifferentiated bit multiplied by the derivative ddt of the other factor, e to the minus st dt. So that's integration by parts. Okay, if you're difficulty seeing it, you just have to kind of map it across to whatever notation you normally think of for integration by parts. Okay, commonly people have it remembered as integral of u dv equals u times v minus the integral of v du. All right. That's, I think a lot of people learn it that notation. Well, that's just exactly what we've done. There. Okay. So integration by parts allows you sometimes to deal with integrals of products of two different functions if you can express one of them as a derivative of something which we've certainly done there. So, okay, making some progress here. <clears throat> We're taking the limit as t goes to infinity. And as before, the dominant term, at least when the real part of s is bigger than zero, the dominant term is going to be this exponential to the minus t, the minus some positive multiple of t. Well, that's going to converge to zero very fast. Okay. If x has a Laplace transform, then it's still going to converge to zero faster. It's still going to overwhelm the behavior of dx dt as t goes to infinity, whatever that is. So as t goes to infinity here, this square bracket term is zero. Then we have to subtract the evaluation of t equals zero. But at t equals zero, you've got e to the zero, which is one, and then you've got the derivative So I've done my integration by parts one. Yeah, sorry. This is just x here. Excuse me. You're not doing too good on spotting my mistakes today. These are genuine mistakes I'm making. Um, is it not x t? Well, x of t, but yeah. Function x, yeah. You could write x of t. Right there. Um. Yeah, so then you're subtracting the evaluation of t equals zero. You got e to the zero, which is one, then you got x of zero. So that's where the 